Android and Apple mobile devices. Ask a Priest Live. Guided by the Holy Spirit and honoring the magisterial teachings of the Church. Faithful Catholic priests answering questions for believers and those seeking truth. Ask a priest because Father knows best. And now, your host, Jordan Pacheco. God be praised in his angels and in his saints. Hello, hello, everybody, listeners and viewers, all welcome back to another great episode of Ask a Priest Live. I'm your host, Jordan Pacheco. It is going to be a great day. I apologize in advance for those who are kind of watching the show a little bit. My lights, all right, let me let me back up a little bit. I'm a cinematographer, which means I love lights and camera angles, all this kind of stuff. And the thing about it is that all the lights in my house are RGB. The point being is I'm actually resetting this stupid one right behind me. So if it flashes at you a little bit, don't be alarmed. That means it's working as intended as I sync it back up. But it's going to be an absolutely great show today. Father William Rock joins us, Fraternity of St. Peter. Father, always a pleasure to be on. How was everything Holy Week, everything Easter related? I'm glad that they didn't run you ragged down there in Houston. We we did well. I think we actually talked about that last time because I was on last week. So uh, same oh, report as last, last time. time. Well, yes. <laughs> Listen, yeah. you know, you guys all dress the same for me, right? So it's sometimes a little difficult. I know it's to keep track of my week. It's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. That's but right. no, no, you're on, like, you're on, like, on, like I said, really. yeah. <laughs> Like I said last week, we were very happy with the way the servers did. I think in terms of the serving, it's the best Holy Week serving we've had since I've been here. So I was very happy about that. Happy to see that. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, always a pleasure to be on with you again. See, this light flashing is beginning to mess with my brain. That must be just what it is. <laughs> well, I was looking at the questions a little bit before the show that's coming in on the docket, Father. There's going to be a lot of really great ones coming up. So we're going to go ahead and get to the questions. Let's go ahead and have some fun. Open up those phone lines. If you ever have any questions of Father Rock, we'd love to hear from you. 1-877-511-5483. Again, that's 1-877-511-5483. Or you can email your questions, priests at the station of the cross.com. It always makes me happy to see that we have a caller from my own home state. We're going to go to Denver and Lori. Hey, Lori, thank you so much for calling into the show today. And what's your question for Father? Hey, Jordan, this is Lori. Um, uh, I have a question. It's kind of an eight years after the fact question. My adult children are now telling me that I was wrong because as a teenager, as teenagers, I required that my husband and I required that they go to church. My children, my middle child told me that she didn't believe in church anymore. Not that she didn't believe in God, but she didn't believe in church. But we still said, you still need to come to mass. And they're telling me that because they were confirmed that I was wrong. So I would like the priest's um, opinion answer on that. Okay, well, I guess that's a little bit of a complicated question um, having to do with parental responsibilities to children. Um, but I think we need to understand, especially with a reference to confirmation, that there is sort of this general idea in the church today that when you receive your confirmation means you become an adult in the church and now you can make your own decisions, kind of comparing it to a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah in the Jewish tradition. But that is not the actual Catholic understanding of what confirmation does for the one who receives it. It's true that it is a perfecting of the graces received in baptism, but the primary purpose of the sacrament of confirmation is to prepare the recipient for combating external threats to their religion. So primarily persecution, external persecution, um, or whatever form that might be. So, that doesn't necessarily mean that one is now an adult in the church because you can get confirmed in a sense, any age in a lot of the Eastern rites or a number of the Eastern rites, they actually do confirmation immediately at, after baptism when uh, the recipient is, is an infant. It could be that if someone is younger and they were in a life threatening situation, they would receive confirmation um, and with their, because of the danger of death. But none of that means that they are now an adult in the church and they can just decide to do whatever they want. It just means they received a sacrament, which is ordered towards, again, um, defending the faith against their external enemies. And so if the person who received that is still a teenager, is still under the roof of their parents, then the parents have an authority over them to raise them in the church and to make sure they're fulfilling their 
Christian and Catholic obligations. Now, how to actually like motivate them to do that? A lot of that's going to depend on the interpersonal interactions between the parent and the child and sort of where the child is in their formation, how much they understand the relationship with their parent and how to go about it. And there are resources that can help people have those discussions. But just to say sort of, you know, I'm confirmed now, so you can't tell me what to do. It's like, no, that's not, that's not how this works. Um, if they are, you know, adult outside the house. Okay. Like that's a different story, but that's not the situation. So I, I think a lot of maybe the angst here is coming down to, or at least using uh, the sacrament of confirmation as a way to argue of over the angst that might be behind of why they don't want to go to church, but just sort of using that as, as the block to prevent the conversation from going forward, or at least of what it would have been uh, a couple of years ago. So I, I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. We kind of settled the debate anyway. Um, <laughs> I don't think my children are going to like it. So <laughs> the answer, but um, because honestly, if you had said, nope, you know, you, you didn't have to make them go to church after confirmation. It was their choice. I, I would have apologized to them, but no, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, have to, I, I guess I was right in doing that. I mean, I never had to take it. I never had to drag them kicking and screaming out of the house. They just told me that they thought it was, you know, wrong of me to be, after the fact, they told me it was wrong of me that, that I made them go to church. No, I think you did the right thing. Thank you. Hearing that really helps. Thank you very, very much. No, I'm not sure how that's going to help with future conversations with with your children, because, um, of course, the the end goal would want to be it because it sounds like they're not practicing. The goal would be to get them back to a state of practicing their faith. Um, so we don't really want to turn it into like, and I was right in your own kind of thing, but really like, you know, this is the truth and I want you to flourish as a human being. And to do that, we have to be in the truth. And part of that involves, you know, subjecting ourselves to supernatural revelation, divine revelation, and the demands that comes from that, or else we're not going to be able to flourish in the way that God wants us to. So we always want to make sure that when we're doing this, we're doing it out of, you know, love for souls and for their spiritual and eternal well-being, and not just sort of a like, who's winning this argument versus that argument. Um, and there are resources to help do that. I think there's a collection of books called What to Say and How to Say It which might have some entries on how to have these type of conversations that doesn't turn into just like, well, I'm right, you're wrong, and you owe me an apology, right? That's not really the type of conversation we want to be having in these type of situations. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, my children aren't conversing with me at all at this point. Um, so all I'm doing right now is praying. Well, that's always a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. But I know that was one of the issues. I've, I've heard that that was one of the issues. So, so thank you for thank you for um, confirming that that you know I did the right thing there. I appreciate that. You're welcome, and be assured of our prayers for you and your family. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Very much so. We definitely will be praying for you and your family. It's it's very, very difficult. We have a lot of calls, Father, that come in, a lot of people who talk about the pain of children and grandchildren being away from the faith. And of course, I think for a lot of people just wondering, how do I do the right thing? How do I get them back? All these kind of things. I think it's a very good reminder that uh, I'm always thinking of St. Monica, right? And St. Augustine. I mean, St. Augustine was middle-aged when he when he came back. And that was through a lot of the tears, prayers, or fasting of St. Monica. So it's to the Holy Spirit that we have to commend our loved ones who, who find themselves away. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we never want to give up hope as long as they're still in this world. And we would, I think, be surprised when we find out how far our prayers and our sacrifices went. But I think it's always good to keep in mind um, in these type of situations, I'd like to draw back to the parable of our Lord when he's talking to the apostles and they're out there and they're looking at the fields. And the, our Lord says, you know, the field is ripe for the harvest, but he doesn't tell them, well, then go harvest. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send the harvesters, which is in a way of saying, like, pray to God that he's going to send who they'll listen to. Now, it turned out in this case, it was the apostles themselves that were going to be sent. But I think a lot of times we can sort of fall in the trap where like, I see the problem. Therefore, I must be the one God wants to solve the problem. No, it might just be that God wants you to pray that he will send the one he wants to solve the problem, the ones that they'll listen to. So I think we always want to keep that in mind that when we see these situations, especially with those who are close to us, to, in a sense, 
pray for them, but leave it in God's hands that he'll send the ones that they'll listen to. Cause it, in most cases, it's not going to be the, the family member. And we need to be sort of accepting of that and leave it in God's hands and God's providence to work it all out, but do our part by, by prayer and, and good example and to be there if they do ever approach us. But, you know, if it's somebody else, then thanks be to God for that. At least they're getting back to, back to the church in a good relationship with God. Amen. We will definitely keep those prayers in our intentions, Lori. Hey, thank you so much for calling in. 1-877-511-5483. If you have any questions for Father Rock today, absolutely love to hear from you. I see all the questions popping up on YouTube. Good to see everybody. Again, that's 1-877-511-5483. Evelyn on YouTube says, good evening to myself and to you, Father Rock. Well, hello, Evelyn. Always good to hear from you. And I love what you say there, Evelyn. With Christ, there is always hope. That's absolutely right. Hope is one of our theological virtues, and we would do very well to remember it. Janice also chimed in she said i feel for the caller lori we've had similar experiences and pains are very difficult to endure pray just like father rock tells us indeed indeed well, that's all we can do we can pray offer supplication hope that the harvesters come and hope that our loved ones are also disposed to hear the harvesters all in god's will hey this is jordan pacheco you're listening to ask a priest live absolutely great questions trickling through even throughout the break, you can go ahead and call in 1-877-511-5483. Again, that's 1-877-511-5483. Or you can email your questions, priests at the station of the cross.com. Coming up next, we have this email pop in. It looks very curious. An anonymous seminarian from New Jersey has an interesting question about the new theology, it looks like. Going to be an absolutely great question, absolutely great answer. Guess what? We'll get to it right after the break. Until then, I'm Jordan Pacheco. Hey, don't go away. We'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. God bless you. With praise, let us awake the dawn. Start your day off right with prayer and reflection. Have mercy on me, God, have mercy. Join the Station of the Cross each weekday morning at 5 a.m. for the Office of Readings, Lauds, and the Holy Rosary. That's weekday mornings at 5 a.m. Eastern. I call to God the Most High, to God who has always been my help. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTagg, your daily host of The Catholic Current, and I'm asking for your help. Folks have been asking me to answer questions on the air, so I'm asking you to send questions to my mailbag. We can do this good work together. Send us your questions at thestationofthecross.com slash askfather. That's thestationofthecross.com slash askfather. I look forward to hearing from you. We hear all the time from listeners who discovered the station by seeing a Try God bumper magnet in traffic. You can request a free bumper magnet and start evangelizing just by driving around town. Go to the stationofthecross.com and click on promotional material under the About tab. There you can request a magnet for your listening area. We even have one for the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Request yours today. Pediatric textbooks describe the ability to roll over as appearing 10 to 20 weeks after birth. However, this impressive coordination is displayed much earlier in the low gravity environment of the womb. The only thing preventing newborns from rolling over is the lack of strength required to overcome the higher gravitational force outside the womb. Human life is sacred. Think about it. Coalitionforlife.com You're listening to Ask a Priest Live from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Have a question? Ask a priest. Call 1-877-511-5483 or email us at priests at thestationofthecross.com. God bless you listeners and viewers all. Welcome back to Ask a Priest Live. I'm your host, Jordan Pacheco. 
Joining me today, of course, is Father William Rock, Fraternity of St. Peter. Got a lot of great questions here on the docket, a lot of them flowing in also on YouTube. I see everybody. How is it going? Please don't forget, of course, to subscribe to all of our live video feeds, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, or Rumble. We have a particular growing little segment here on YouTube, which is really nice to see. But again, let's go to youtube.com slash Station of the Cross. You can do the same thing on Facebook and on Rumble too. And of course, we're very much appreciated no matter how you listen to, of course, all you wonderful folks out there in radio land or whatever they call it these days. Also people who listen on the iCatholic radio app and of course our website itself, thestationofthecross.com, Ask a Priest Live. Absolutely very, very great that we can get so much interaction happening live. Well, Father, I kind of teased this question before the end of the last segment. Great thing because Ladies and gentlemen, this is a first for Ask a Priest Live. We have not just anybody, but an anonymous seminarian all the way from Joy Z. All right, so this is what they say, Father. A really, really great question. Absolutely perfect for a seminarian. At the Diocesan Seminary, I noticed that the majority of theologians teach from the perspective of the new theology, particularly the communio school, such as de Lubach, von Balthasar, and Ratzinger. In comparison, many traditionalist priests adhere to strict observance Thomism with Gary Grulagrange as the superstar hero and uphold the position that St. Thomas Aquinas should be upheld as the go-to theologian before anything else. As a diocesan seminary in theology, I'm struggling to reconcile both schools. On the one hand, I agree that the manualist tradition has dried up theology to the point that it has become an academic course and some writings of the communal school are brilliant. On the other hand, I'm also aware of Gary Grew's critics of the new theology and how it ultimately led to modernism. What is the fraternity or the institute's view towards the new theology, and how should one approach the problem? Great. Well, thank you for that. There's a lot there, so maybe we'll try to take it bit by bit. Um, glad to see that there's a seminarian from New Jersey, because I think as we probably talked about at some point, I'm originally from New Jersey, so it's good good to see that. Um so where to start? Uh, why do we hold up St. Thomas as our go-to? Because the Pope said so. There are any number of papal documents that you can pull up over the course of centuries or however long they've been writing about it, and their advice is always go to Thomas, ite ad tomam, because his method is safe and it is fruitful. So why do we hold up St. Thomas? It's We hold up St. Thomas because it's the perennial tradition of the church since the time of St. Thomas to do so, right? He has been the go-to theologian. You know, at the Council of Trent, his Summa was used as a reference by the fathers of Trent. And so we're just following that tradition. And then the question then comes to sort of how does that compare with uh, sort of this new theology that came out I think in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the manualist tradition. Now, it is true that as time went on, Thomism, scholasticism, in a sense, just evolved into commentaries on commentaries and commentaries on St. Thomas's writing. And it did become this very tiresome thing where they were getting more and more and further, further removed from St. Thomas's writings themselves. Uh, but this changed under, I believe, Pope Leo XIII, who called for renewal in Thomism to go back to the original sources, to Thomas's original writings, and to sort of do that. And there was this flourishing of Thomism that happened under his pontificate and the pontificates following up until sort of the early 20th century. And we have uh, the great theologians like Gary Lagrange and others. Um, and, but the, and the manual tradition, as it's called in a certain sense, although it's not exactly the same path as this sort of commentary path of St. Thomas is helpful, right? Because it gives answers that you need sort of at your fingertips, especially for moral theology. Like, is this moral? Is this not moral? That can be very helpful if you just kind of need the answer immediately. But the the manualist, in a sense, should presume that you're well-founded in theology and philosophy before you just sort of jump in and using them. So that might come up from a lack of well training in the seminary on how to appreciate the manuals and not necessarily the manuals themselves. But then during you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, with the rediscovery or discovery of a lot of texts from the fathers, the early church fathers are then being translated and they're more widely available. It, that sort of played into this um, growth of this other school, this new theology school, which sort of started differently we can say from the Thomistic tradition. And as the questioner pointed out, this was criticized by Gary Goulagrange, they said this leads to modernism. 
um, because it basically leads to relativism, like theology, truth it just becomes in a sense relative. There was a recent book released uh, by Dr. Minard, which is a translation of Thomistic responses to the new theology, which would be helpful for those who would like to go on a deep dive to see what the Dominicans, the Thomists were saying at the time, especially Gary Lagrange and their response to this. Um, but so how should we say as Thomists, as scholastics, um, approach to new theology? And I think we need to approach it the same way St. Thomas would approach anything, which is you take the good and you leave the bad. Right, that's always been sort of the Thomistic principle. St. Thomas drew from pagans like Plato and Aristotle. Cicero, he drew from Muslim uh, philosophers. He drew from Jewish philosophers. He drew from the early church fathers, the church councils, everything. And it's always sort of that, you know, use the good and leave the bad. And were there insights that we can get from the new theology and their study of the fathers? Yes. And the thing about it is that it, Thomism itself is flexible enough to take in the good from other, other systems, other places, and incorporate it to make itself better. Um, so that is how I think we should approach it, that if we do find things in reading De Lubach or von Balthasar or Ratzinger or whoever it might be, that we're like, yes, this is true, and this is good, good, and this is beautiful, and it can be incorporated into Thomism, then we should do that. Um, but always sort of using St. Thomas and his methods and his approach to thing as, as the foundation for that. Because, again, he's been sort of the go-to theologian, not just by the fraternity or the institute, but by the church herself for so many hundreds of years. That is, in a certain sense, the Catholic uh, theology that we should be going with. But, of course, St. Thomas didn't create it whole cloth. He is, in a sense, bringing to perfection all of the different trends of the uh, philosophy and theology that were happening from the fathers and the early medievals and sort of synthesizing all of that and bring it to a new perfection. And that is why we can rely on St. Thomas because of not just himself, but everything that he's building on. So I hope that that's helpful. Um, I mean, there's a lot more that can probably go into this conversation, but I think that's a, a good, a good answer for the time being. A, a tremendous answer indeed, and a great question. A good question coming out of a seminary. That's that's a good sign for me that seminarians are thinking like that. So hey, thanks for sending that in anonymous. God bless you. One eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Again, that call in number one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Going to move on to this email that just popped up, and Sean, it kind of bleeds into exactly what you were just saying, Father. So I wonder if you kind of answered it, but I think it's it's a good thing just to reiterate. Sean says. Why do several of the priests put so much weight on St. Thomas Aquinas? Shouldn't the weight be placed mainly on Jesus and the scriptures? I understand based on answers on other shows why people pray to saints, but I don't understand why some things are repeated from saints when they are clearly more based on the culture of the time and human nature, not God. Thank you for addressing. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that uh, question, Sean. And this does sort of continue from our train of thought in, in the previous question. And I think the reason why we need something in this, and particularly St. Thomas, is because in a certain sense, like scripture revelation is the raw data. And we need a way of systematizing it and a way of understanding it and seeing how everything connects. And that is, in a sense, what theology does. It takes the raw data of divine revelation found in scripture and tradition and systematizes it and tries to make sense of it using good philosophical principles from human reasoning. So we use theology in order to better understand and to appreciate what God has revealed through Jesus Christ and through um, the other sort of modes of revelation, through the apostles, through the prophets, and and so on. And then to the point of like, well, doesn't this seem like it's based more on culture of the time and human nature? Well, in a certain sense, yes, because God made revelation for man. So he's going to make it in a way that's compatible with human nature. And that's a general principle of, you know, Catholic theology is that grace builds on and perfects nature, but doesn't ignore it or destroys it. So if we're saying God gave us revelation, it has to be in a way compatible with what we are as, as human beings. And so understanding our nature and what we need as you know, a composite of body and soul and the philosophy that goes along with that, and then using that as a certain lens to understand what God is doing is going to be very helpful because it'll give us a more perfect understanding of what God was doing. 
And in regards to the culture aspect, the Thomistic philosophy is better, or theology is perennial. It starts from the very beginning with Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and goes up through the different schools, up through the East, the West, and it comes together. And so by the time you get to St. Thomas, you have something that transcends particular cultures. So it's not particularly tied to St. Thomas's time. There are certain scientific things that Thomas will say about, you know, the four elements of the universe or sort of cosmology, which are outdated, but that has more to do with his physical understanding of the world, but not his philosophical or theological principles. Those principles are sound because they are based in reality and man reflecting on reality. As it's said, you know, God speaks to us through sacred scripture, divine revelation, but he also speaks to us through the book of nature. You know, it's uh, St. Paul says in Romans, you know, the pagans can know that God exists by reflecting on nature and certain truths can become from nature. And because God is the author of all truth, be it found in divine revelation, be it found in nature, they all need to harmonize with each other. So there's nothing wrong with using principles and truths found in one to augment or magnify the ones found in the other. So I think basically it gets down to it. Scripture, divine revelation is the raw data. We need to systematize in order to understand it. We have to use the tools that we have from our nature, from reflecting on creation in order to do that. And it finds a perfection, like I said, in St. Thomas Aquinas and his method. And that's why we should use it because it actually does get us deeper into the things of God and God himself than we would otherwise. So I hope that helps. I love how very organically that did, in fact, bleed from our very first question. I hope that helped, Sean. A very, very great answer, Father. 1-877-511-5483. Father William Rock joins me today, Fraternity of St. Peter. Look at all these questions. I know that there are some people out there in the audience going, oh, man, I got to put on my theology cap. I got other ones in the till, too, people, but these are all very, very important. As I've always said, hey, no questions too big, no questions too small. Go on and call in 1-877-511-5483. Or, of course, you can email your questions like this one we just got from Sean. Priest at the station of the cross.com, as well as type up your questions in the live chat, YouTube, Facebook, and Rumble. Woods on Rumble says, Father Rocks. Oh, it's a pun. I get it. Ha! Father Rock, you rock. So well done on the pun there, Woods. Thank you so much for giving us that comment. Looks like we got a lot of great questions. Brother Knight Scott out of Rochester, New York. You'll be next up after the break. A couple of questions there. I see that you left. We also have another seminarian coming up, Father, this time anonymous out of Houston, Texas. A lot of anonymous, actually, now that I'm looking at the docket. And I also see YouTube, of course, I see all of your questions and comments. Don't worry, we'll get to them right as we're able to. In the meantime, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. You can call in even throughout the break. We're just waiting for your call. 1-877-511-5483. Again, that call in number, 1-877-511-5483. I'm Jordan Pacheco. Don't go anywhere. We have a couple of questions coming out of Rochester, New York, right after the break. I'll see you then. God bless you. Download the app to take our programming with you wherever you go. Hear what listeners are saying about the regularly updated iCatholic Radio app. The programs on iCatholic Radio are uplifting, educational, and have served to deepen my faith as a Catholic. Thank you for this amazing station. Download the free iCatholic Radio app in your Android or Apple store today. If you already have the app, please consider giving us a five-star review or telling a friend about it. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. For what you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that and through your programs I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the station on the cross. 
Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. 30 Seconds on the Gifts of the Holy Spirit, brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The gift of knowledge allows us to see circumstances of our lives from a supernatural perspective. It can be difficult to explain to others how this gift is at work, but it greatly aids us in understanding the truths of the faith and the order of the universe as designed by God. The gift of knowledge also helps us in learning what God has revealed to us through nature and His church. Did you know that live video of the show is just a few clicks away? Follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Ask a Priest Live. Search for The Station of the Cross on Rumble. Or check out our Watch Live page at thestationofthecross.com. God bless you, listeners and viewers all. Welcome back to Ask a Priest Live. I'm your host, Jordan Pacheco. I'm joined today by Father William Rock, Fraternity of St. Peter. A lot of great questions trickling through. Can't believe we're already halfway through the show. So, if you haven't already called in with your question, hey, what are you waiting for? And if the answer is, I'm waiting for the end of the show, Jordan, you know that's not going to work. You're not going to get it in. Call now. Do yourself a favor. And also, do us a favor by doing that, huh? one 511 And of course, you may email your questions, priests at thestationofthecross.com. Well, Brother Knight Scott out of Rochester, New York, always a pleasure to hear from you. Not on the line, but did leave these couple of questions behind, Father. I love this first question, but I'm going to just say, uh, Father, does a priest always have to use incense for the benediction? What can someone do if they have an allergy to it? <laughs> Well, thank you for that question there. So for those who might not know, uh, exposition and benediction is when uh, the priest or the deacon will take what's called a luna, which is a special glass case that has a consecrated host in it, which is usually a little larger, and puts it into what's called a monstrance and leave it uh, sort of exposed there, so it's exposition exposed for the worship and veneration of the faithful. Then at the end of the ceremony, the priest will take uh, the monstrance and bless the people with the sacred host that's contained inside. And as far as I am aware, it is prescribed that incense has to be used at the beginning when it's first exposed and also at the end during uh, the blessing and when it's reposed back in the tabernacle. If someone has an allergy, I guess your options are either sit further back in the church or maybe tell the priest that you have an issue with it and ask if you can just use less incense. Uh, because the priest can control how much he puts in. Some priests like to put in a lot. Some priests like to put in a little. Um, and so if there are some issues, maybe talk to the priest and see if he will uh, do less or sit further back in the church. I think that's that's the best we can do. I, I'll get to a second one right quick, Father, but I just want to weigh in on that real quick. I Maybe this is, a, this is my little trad heart, right? I'm on the polar opposite spectrum. Like I want every time incense to happen, I want the church to essentially be hot boxed. I want everyone to be coughing <laughs> and dizzy because it, it's my cinematographer brain. It's better for the image too, but it just looks so cool when that happens. Yes, I do think there's sort of that relation with the glory cloud from the Old Testament, right? So we read about like Solomon's dedication to the temple and the glory cloud came down and like no one could see what they were doing because like God's glory completely filled the place. And so in a certain way, we can see that the same with the incense of God's glory filling the place where we're at. So I think there is something very fitting uh, to having that. Absolutely. Uh, Solomon's glory cloud is way better of an analogy than saying hot boxing to church father. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I just got to go with, I'm living in Colorado. Got to go with what I see. Okay. Hey, second question that uh, brother Knight Scott left. It sees there are a limited number of Saturday masses. Is it permissible to attend a Saturday morning mass, even if it's a priestly ordination or a deacon's ordination to count as a Saturday daily mass? Um, uh, I understand the question. I I Mm -hmm. think so. So it's just a mass for Saturday, not one that's satisfying for Sunday. Yeah. So I thought that too, but no, he's talking about like a daily mass for Saturday. Uh, yes, (laughs) I think, uh, I guess like, I don't, I don't, yes, I understand the distinction he's trying to, to make. Of a mass set on the day is the mass set on that day, regardless if it's the oh, actual I, liturgy for the day or an ordination mass or, or something like like that. I mean, it's 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 you're attending a mass on Saturday, so like in a just just in general, if you go to a mass on Saturday and the priest is like, I it's a feria, but I'm doing the votive mass of 
you know, whoever, St. Joan of Arc. Um, like, is it still Saturday Mass? Like, yes, because it happened on Saturday, even if it's not the actual feast day of St. Joan of Arc, or if it's an ordination Mass, um, it's, it's a Mass on Saturday. Um, but since there's no obligation to attend Mass generally on Saturdays, I don't see, like, why this would really be an issue. Because um, normally we don't count daily masses like that. It's like, did you attend mass that day? Yes. Okay. Then, then you attended mass that. Day. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the question is getting at, but hopefully that gets us near the answer. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Brother Knight Scott, if that needs a little bit more clarification, Hey, don't be afraid to call back in, but Hey, thanks for sending those in. 1-877-511-5483. Again, Father William Rock joins me today. A lot of great questions up here in the till. Love to hear from you. 1-877-511-5483, or of course, email your questions, priests at the station of the cross.com. Michelle on YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and turn my gaze over to you guys on YouTube. Good to see you all. A lot of great, great uh, sort of chat going on. And Michelle asks this question, Father, what are the origins of the Beretta? Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, so for those who might not know, the Beretta is the black sort of squarish hat that the ministers will wear during mass and generally has three fins that stick out of them. Uh, and he wears it when he presses to the altar and then takes it off, puts it on when he's sitting and then wears it when he leaves. Um, the origin of it is very practical. It's to keep the priest's head warm. Uh, like, it's like so many things that just had a practical reason in the beginning. Um, but in the beginning, very beginning, it was a very sort of soft, fluffy hat. And so what happens, you have the soft, fluffy hat on your head and you would grab it to take it off and you would form these little dimples or these bumps. And those bumps were eventually sort of codified as the fins and the hat itself became more sturdy and harder. It's interesting because the, the hat that is where the Beretta came from is also the same hat where the, uh, graduation cap came from. They were originally the same same thing they just kind of went in different directions so that's the origin so why's the origin keep your head warm why does that bumps because people would grab it and it was soft and then they just kind of formed it um there is some symbolism that can be associated with the beretta though uh in the tonsure ceremony which is historically when one would enter into the clerical state and receive the right to wear the cassock and the surplus uh, you would go before the bishop and he would cut five tufts of hair from your head in the shape of a cross while you're repeating a psalm with him. It's been pointed out that there are five points on the Beretta, sort of the middle and then the four surrounding, and that those represent the, the, the cuts of the tonsure. So in a certain way, it can be seen as a remembrance to the priest of his tonsure that he dedicated himself to the service of the Lord. So I hope that helps. That's a very, very interesting question, Michelle. Hey, thanks so much for sending it in. 1-877-511-5483. Again, if we'd like, oh, English is so difficult. Let me try that again. If you'd like to get your questions in from Father Rock, that's what I was trying to say. See, my light turns off one episode and I fall to pieces over here. Call in 1-877-511-5483. There we go, back on rails. Or of course, email your questions, priests at the station of the cross.com. So let's type them up on YouTube, Facebook, and Rumble, just like that wonderful question there from Michelle off of YouTube. Gonna pop in with this email, Father. This is great because this is also another anonymous seminarian, this time from Houston, Texas, your neck of the woods. And they say this, Father, do you find it difficult being in an order that takes you away from your family? And do you find it harder to be away from your parents or siblings? Well, that's a very good question. So I would think that in general, regardless, like Fraternity of St. Peter, any sort of order, outside the diocese where people are being moved here and there. Uh, I would think that it would be a common experience that everyone would experience some sort of, you know, loneliness and separation from their family, from uh, their friends, from, you know, where they grew up. Uh, I think that's just a human, a human thing to do. Like we don't stop being human just because we're ordained priest. And so I would assume that that would be a very common experience throughout all the ages of the church of missing your own, but realizing that you're doing it for a higher reason, a higher calling that God has done, uh, called you to this for a reason. Um, and it's sort of a cross that's carried as part of, of your mission. 
Um, I think today, though, there's sort of a, a double-edged sword with technology and that it's easier to keep in touch with folks is back in the day, you'd have to wait like a year for like a letter to go back and forth between Europe or whatever, however it might have been, where we can sort of have instant communication. Like I have chats with my parents and my sister or my cousins and, and sort of everyone back home so we can kind of keep in touch, kind of know what's going on. So there's a closer connection. But at the same point, you see everything you're missing out on or sort of in real time. Uh, so back in in the day, again, if it took like a year or six months or whatever to get a letter from Europe to the far west of the United States, by the time all the news got to you, like, well, okay, it's over. It was six months ago. Um, I hope they had a good time, but it's a little different kind of seeing it in real time. So the technology, it, it's a blessing, but also an additional hardship in a certain sense. But I think, yeah, it's in, in normal. I think it's normal for a human being to you know, find it difficult to be away from their loved ones, from their family, from friends, from where they grew up. And I think that's just part of being human. Father, as a Roman Catholic priest, that means that you've been uh, obligated to see uh, going my way with Bing Crosby at least 10 times, right? I have seen that movie, yes. Okay. I'm not a big fan of say, it. One of the... <laughs> Well, I, yeah, you don't say, uh, I was, I was just going to comment <laughs> that one of the, uh, one of the plot points is that, uh, the old Irish priest hasn't seen his mom who's back in Ireland for I think decades at that point. Right. And at the very end, they actually bring her over to the state. So I just was thinking about that when you're talking about how communication has made it easier, but obviously it is indeed a double-edged sword for priests who might be deployed elsewhere in the world. Also, you should see um, it, by the I, way. Yeah, also, you should see it because I, I know you like yeah. to write movie reviews. So you should at least tell people why you don't like it. I mean, I, yeah, I guess I could always do that about like, why I don't like it. Um, I like Bells of St. Mary's better. Um, yeah, me I too. don't really like going my way. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I just have some issues because it's the whole thing about like, it's this new hip priest who's going to come in and like shake everything up because this is what the church needs today. And we're like is it really like, is this really what the church needs today? <laughs> um, um, because this seems like, uh, it's like, is it like, um, and it's played off as a good thing, right? He's the, he's the new pastor and like, he's going to change the parish around and like, it's going to be great. He's like, yeah, but like, he has this couple that's like cohabitating. He's like, I'm going to sing you a song and not tell you that you're sinning. And like, everything will be fine. It's like, is that, no, <laughs> I can't really know if that's like the father, best, best father, you're wrong. You're wrong at that plot point. Remember they get married actually. They, they, before, before they, yeah, I know the, at, at the end, so that they the do. War. Yeah. Yeah. At the end they get married, but like the pastoral approach that you actually see him doing is I'm going to sing you a song. And you're like, is that really like, <laughs> you know what, you know what, we're going to fact like, check yeah. this during the break. I would give, I would pay money that they're already married when he sings them the song at the, at the, in the apartment. No, they're, you know, they're, I'm, I'm going to let you have that opinion for now. No. Okay. They're, they're James, fact check that yeah. for us. We're going to figure this out. <laughs> Oh, I absolutely love it. <laughs> hey, we're going to go to New Hampshire and James right now is on the line. Hey, James, thank you so much for waiting on the line there. And what's your question for father? Yes, uh, my question is, I have a, a little cousin who's thinking of going to seminary school, just out of college, who's asking me how much uh, is seminary school a year and uh, does he have, does he need to have an SAT score or any requirements to uh, enter it? Yeah, things like that. Well, thank you for your question. Some of it is going to depend upon where he's applying to, if it's through a religious order, if it's through a diocese. In most cases, from what I understand, the seminarians might be encouraged to help pay the tuition but they're not required to. And in most cases, the organization or the diocese will pay for it because they don't want someone either prevented from pursuing the priesthood because of their economic situation or feel like they're trapped in the process because of the money that's already been invested. So in general, the church, the diocese, the religious order wants to ensure that the one who's discerning has as much freedom as possible. And generally they'll, take the brunt of the financial responsibility and this is why when there's collections you know like today's special sunday collection for like the seminary is like we need to be generous to realize like this is the main way that we're paying for these priests they're not normally doing it out of pocket um in terms of the education requirements it's just going to depend on 
the where you're applying. So I would just, if he's interested in certain places, to actually inquire with them and find out what's required. So I hear the music, so I know we're about to cut to commercial, but I hope that's helpful. Absolutely. Hey, James, thank you so much for calling in. And we'll definitely be praying for your cousin if he is indeed called to be a priest that his seminary journey goes very smooth as possible. Could highly recommend the Fraternity of St. Peter's Seminary out there in Nebraska. I hear that place puts out pretty good priests like Father Rock with us today. Call in throughout the break, one 511 5483 I'm Jordan Pacheco. We only got one more segment. Can't wait to get to all the rest of these questions right after the break. God bless you. Think about this. Less than four in 10 Americans can name any of the five freedoms guaranteed in the First Amendment. Yet, 41% of Americans under 35 think the First Amendment goes too far. Do you know your five freedoms guaranteed in the First Amendment? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to peaceably assemble, freedom to petition the government. Think first. Go to thinkfirstamendment.org to learn more. Coming up Friday on The Simple Truth, live at 4 p.m. Eastern, it's Friday with Father with co-host Father Stephen Imbarato, providing cutting-edge pro-life commentary you're not going to hear anywhere else. What is Trump's new position on abortion, and how have pro-life leaders responded? Much is being exposed right now, and we're going to help you to see it all on The Simple Truth, live at 4 p.m. Looking for a simple, creative, and easy way to contribute to the Station of the Cross? Why not consider a transfer of stock or donating a mutual fund gift to help support us in our work of evangelization? Transferring a gift of long-term appreciated stocks, those owned for more than one year, can provide significant tax advantages by allowing you to deduct the fair market value while paying no capital gain tax. Today, most stock transfers are easily made electronically from your broker. Just call us at 1-877-888-6279. That's 1-877-888-6279. Your broker will need to indicate the number of shares being transferred and the QCIP number of the shares. May God bless you for considering a gift to the Station of the Cross so that we can continue proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity for years to come. Enjoying the show? Catch up on podcasts of past episodes on your favorite platform. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, TuneIn, and the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. God bless you listeners and viewers all, and welcome back to Ask a Priest Live. I'm your host, Jordan Pacheco. Joining me today is Father William Rock, Fraternity of St. Peter. Man, Father, can't believe we're already in the last segment. This has been an absolutely great episode. We're going to do our best to get through as many of these other questions as we can. But hey, if we don't do it today, we always have tomorrow. So for all of our listeners and viewers, go on and call in with your questions. 1-877-511-5483. Again, that's 1-877-511-5483. Or email your questions, priests at thestationofthecross.com. This email popped up really right before the break, Father. This comes from Peter. He says this, Father, I want to, uh, let me try again. Father, I wanted to enroll a deceased person's name as an intention for Gregorian masses, something that I have never done before. I have two questions. Number one, would you put a name as an intention that you definitely know is correct, but less specific, or put a name that is possibly correct, but more specific, knowing that God is specific when it comes to our prayer intentions? For example, Thomas Smith versus Thomas A. Smith versus Tom Smith, that sort of thing. And number two, does specific... How does specific, hmm, sorry, how specific does the intention of the name have to be as it relates to someone's baptismal name? Well, thank you for your question, Peter. Uh, for those who don't know, Gregorian masses are masses offered up for the repose of a soul, uh, which is, I believe, 30 continuous days. So it's one, one mass every day for 30 days continuously. So it's... um. Not something you can generally do in a parish. You'd have to do that through, say, like a monastery or something like that. Um, but in terms of just intentions in general, I would say go with the one that you know is correct, but less specific. 
a lot of times when the priests are looking at these, it's always understood like, okay, like this is what the intention says, but it's also according to the intent of the one who made the intention. So as long as you're relatively clear about what it is you want when you make the request, then it'll be, um, it should be fine. Yeah, that's what I would say. Well, there, there it is. Hey, that is a very great question, Peter. Thank you so much also for praying for the souls of your loved ones. We should all remind ourselves that the church does offer Gregorian masses, particularly for this. We should take great advantage of it. So God bless you and we'll pray for the repose of the soul of your deceased loved one. 1-877-511-5483. Again, that call in number, 1-877-511-5483. Anonymous, oh, this is a good question. This is something I've been wondering too. Hey, Anonymous says this, Father, I often see statues of St. Joseph holding lilies. What is the meaning of the lilies? Oh, good question. Yes. Especially we had the feast of St. Joseph not too long ago. Um, so according to pious tradition, Our Lady was dedicated by her parents to the temple once she was old enough to, to live there on her own. And she grew up there. She grew up at the temple hearing the praises of God, working on vestments and things like that and being raised in uh, in the Jewish faith by, by the ones that were there. When she became old enough to be married, uh, the priest sent out a call to all the eligible members of the family of David, because Mary is from the family of David. And according to Jewish law, you're supposed to sort of marry those who are close to you and kin. And different um, suitors presented themselves. And what happened was, that according to this tradition, they all presented their staffs to the high priest and the staff of St. Joseph uh, blossomed into lilies to indicate that he was the one chosen by God to be our lady's husband. And that's why a lot of times you'll see St. Joseph holding a staff that's blossoming into lilies in reference to that, that miracle, that pious tradition, that that's how uh, God indicated who is to be our lady's husband. So I hope that helps. That's a very great question indeed. Hey, Anonymous, thank you so much for sending that in. Only about five more minutes of show left. So if you want to go ahead and get your call in, my advice is do it now. Yes, I know I say don't do it in the last five minutes because then they all get jumbled up, but it's looking pretty clear. You might have a shot. 1-877-511-5483. Again, that call in number 1-877-511-5483. Gonna hop to this quick question. It's a really interesting one, a very good one that might even close us out of the show, Father. Anonymous from Ohio says this, during the creed, we say that Jesus descended into hell. However, I was informed by a deacon that Jesus did not really descend into hell. Please explain where we think Jesus was until he rose on the third day. And also, why do we keep saying hell if this is a mistranslation? Why don't we correct it to ad infernos? Okay, well, thank you for your question. Hopefully I'll do my best to answer in the time we have. So according to basically all tradition, uh, when our Lord died, his soul was separated from his body. That's what death is. Um, but his divinity remained united to, to both. His soul went to what is called the limbo of the fathers, where all the just who died before heaven was open due to the closed because of original sin, the sin of Adam, opened by our Lord at the ascension. All those who died sort of in the meanwhile went to this place called the limbo of the fathers. And that's where our Lord went. It's referenced in one of the epistles of Peter when it says our Lord preached to those in prison. That's what it's talking about. The question is like, where is that limbo of the fathers? And according to the tradition, if, according to St. Thomas, uh, it is part of hell, but it's at the edge because limbo, limbus is a Latin word that means sort of edge or border. And so it's part of hell, but it's not like the fiery, punishy parts of hell. It's just a sort of a place of, of waiting. So when we say he descended to hell, we mean he went to this part of hell, which we call the limbo of the fathers. So hell in a very general sense, not hell in the fire and punishment sense, but this place of waiting, kind of on the edge of the region we'd call hell. Um, the word in the, in the creed, the ad infernos, sort of like into the lower places, um, I think would be a more literal translation, but hell gets the point of cross because hell in a general sense is where the limbo of the fathers was located. So that's where he went and he brought them out with him at the resurrection. And then at the ascension, after he opened the gates of heaven, 
they all were able to go into heaven. So um, maybe that's what the deacon was getting at. I mean, we do have to accept, you know, it's in the creed, like he went to this place, which we call theologically the limbo of the fathers. I think that has to be accepted. Um, whether or not we're going to call it hell, part of hell, and the, the tradition is that it's part of hell. So we're kind of using the more general term for the more specific location. So I hope that helps. This reminds me, Father, of course, that if anyone reads the Divine Comedy, in particular Dante's Inferno, that past the abandon all hope ye who enter in gates of hell is actually that first level. So obviously this is poetry, people. This isn't theology. But that first rung of hell is limbo. So that might be kind of a, an inspiration coming forth of that limbo, the forefathers that our Lord descended into. I think it's good to keep in mind that Dante has been called St. Thomas in poetry, basically. Um, so you take the theology of St. Thomas and put it into poetry and you get Dante. So there, there are some good theological principles and foundations behind uh, what he's writing there. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great question from Anonymous in Ohio. Hey, maybe send this segment off to that deacon for a little bit of clarification. But uh, thanks for sending it in. One eight seventy seven five eleven five four eight three. Looks like I have about thirty seconds until the closing music. An absolute great show. So grateful for each and every one of you who've helped make the show possible. If you love our content, please don't forget, of course, to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, and Rumble. And of course, a huge thing you can do, of course, is to leave a five star review on all of our podcast sites: Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify. I like to use Spotify a lot for the show. Just gone over. Use Ask a Priest Live. We have such a nice little following, and that makes it easier for other Catholics to know that this is a great resource in their lives if they have questions that they need answers to. Father Rock, I'm so grateful for you joining me today. Before you go, will you please leave us with your blessing? Benedictio Domini Potentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancendus Super Vos et Mania Semper. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Father. And thank you, each and every one of you listeners and viewers. This show is fun, man. It is good to be back with some regularity. Please continue to pray for me as, of course, we pray for all of you. Tomorrow, I'm sure, is also going to be an absolutely great show. Let's see who's on the docket with me. Oh, well, it's none other than Father Alan Maria Wharton, Franciscans of the Immaculate, tomorrow for our Friday show. So that's going to be absolutely great. If we didn't get to your questions today, YouTube, don't worry. We usually like to put them in the email docket. But, of course, we'll try to make them right up for tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Jordan Pacheco. This is Ask a Priest Live. We're going to see you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern time. God bless you and may I keep you. See you tomorrow. <laughs>